Chapter 2 Sector Cobalt Headquarters aren't easy to find, at least not to the naked eye. I mean, come on, would you want just any average Joe stumbling into the most top-secret, classified, badass factory this side of planet Earth? Fuck no. But I'm no average Joe. Hell, I'm not even named Joe, so you can absolutely forget using that saying with me. I'm serious. Please don't even consider it. My name's not Joe. It simply will not apply. Thank you. Anyway, I've been a Cobalt agent for over ten years. And even after all this time, I still get slightly aroused when I pull into the parking lot. It's not a sexual thing. At least, I don't think it is, but who knows? My entire career is based around sex. I'm a seduction agent, after all. Best one there is, matter of fact. But I don't think this chub that's swelling up inside my skin-tight slacks has anything to do with sex. I think it has absolutely everything to do with my country. I've sacrificed more for the stars and stripes in my sleep than most do in an entire lifetime. Hell, when I close my eyes... I hear our country's national anthem, I'm Proud to Be an American, by Lee Greenwood. And when I see a bald eagle, even cartoon versions on stamps and coins, I get rock fucking hard. But don't be ridiculous, I'm not into fucking animals, so you can just go ahead and slow your roll right there. I just love America. Besides, I don't think there's an eagle large enough to take all of me. Eagle dicks can't be as big as human dicks, and mine is well above human average, so there's simply no way I could even fuck a bald eagle, because I have no earthly idea where the bird vagina is located. As I walk towards the front doors of HQ and am totally not thinking about where an eagle's pussy is and the logistics of fucking a bird, I start to wonder about what Captain Castle finds so urgent that he had to interrupt my before work workout. Surely, it's an assignment that's of the utmost importance. That I get. And surely, seeing as I'm a seduction agent, it must be imperative that I bed someone from around the globe with access to privileged information while still making us both orgasm, probably simultaneously. See, even though I'll technically be on the clock, I never go through the motions. I'm a damn professional, and I take my job very seriously. It's just odd for the captain to call me in like this. This must be one hell of a target, and I can't wait. Check-in always takes a little while. Like I said before, they don't just let anyone in here. This isn't like your job, you pencil-pushing fuckheads. I don't have to spend 15 minutes listening to Carol drone on at the front desk like you, telling you about her weekend before you can even get to work. I know how it goes for you following along at home, classic Carol regaling you with the story of how her rascal grandkids were in town for the weekend, and you just have to sit there and listen like you're interested. Like it's a good story. One of those boring old Carol stories. The one she always tells you. Hell, probably every receptionist in the country tells the same one about their grandkids at your shitty kind of job. Something about how these trouble-making kids were digging holes in the backyard, making a real mess. Not listening to her when she calls them in for supper, covered in dirt. Lame-ass receptionist story, like she's not the only one telling it going on and on about how her grandkids were just digging around in that backyard, and even though she told them to stop, they just wouldn't listen. Until one of them accidentally struck an old ancient alien artifact and unleashed a celestial spirit into the neighborhood that went door to door, melting each and every one of the neighbor's bodies straight through to the bone, until the alien life form had swallowed up enough energy and matter to finally return to its home planet in a brilliant, blinding white fireball seen counties away. Fucking Carol, we get it. Your grandkids, they don't always listen to what you say. You tell stories like this all the time. Get an original story, Carol. So, no, your job is nothing like the front desk at Sector Cobalt, where there's no Carol here. Back in a real office, at a real reception area, I'm wincing as the guards take my rectal swab with a Q-tip. Don't eat the corn, fellas, I say to the guards with a smile. I make this joke at least twice a month, and it kills every time. Sure, they aren't laughing anymore, but... I can tell it still makes them chuckle in their souls. And it's especially creative and funny because I don't even eat corn. But I use corn as a comedic device because I know it's a food that's supposed to stay in your shit for a while after you eat it. And you can see it poking out of your shit. That's funny to think about, so I like to make them think about it too. Once my rectal swab is cleared, it's on to the security questions. When I first became a cobalt agent, they had me write down thousands of questions that only I would know the answer to. Each morning, they randomly select three. And once I've answered them all, I'm in. It's top secret as fuck. So, they begin. What's your deepest, darkest fear? The guard asks. Two-part answer. One, my dick getting broke. Two, rice. Vile, wicked grain. I tell him as the first security light turns from red to green. What's something you consider to be a lie or a fable? He asks next. Seahorses, I respond immediately. I've never seen one with my own two eyes, and I'm pretty sure they're not real. The second light flashes green. One more to go. What's the one thing you're most sure of in this entire world? 
the guard asks, his finger hovering over the vaporized button, should I answer incorrectly? Easy, I say. The thing I'm most sure of in this entire fucking world is that every single Kevin Costner movie would be better had it starred Kurt Russell instead. The final green light flashes on the screen before us as the blast doors hiss and plume smoke as they slowly stretch open up ahead. As I'm about to go through, I look back at the guards with a super cool grin on my face. And even though I'm inside and it's pretty dark in here, I reach into my pocket and pull out a pair of shades and put them on for effect. Turns out, I forgot that I was already wearing a pair of shades. So I end up putting a pair of sunglasses over top another pair of sunglasses. Too late now, though. I just try to keep the second pair from falling off and commit 100% to the gesture as I turn around and head through the fog, discreetly taking my second pair of sunglasses off when I'm outside their view. Close call. Still cool. I make my way towards the super high-tech elevator. It's really silver and shiny. High-tech. Future, baby. Hell yes. I lean in forward towards the retina scan, take off my other pair of sunglasses, and place my eyeballs onto the eye shelf to get my eye read out of my eye parts. I'm not a scientist, but I'm sure that's how this works. The elevator door beeps and crawls open before me. Once inside, the doors begin to close when there's a raspy, familiar voice from behind. Hold that door, you big idiot. I turn with a grin to find my partner, Kate Bystander, hopping inside. Which, now that I think of it, is kind of a major security flaw that only I needed to do the retina scan, but could hold the door open for anyone behind me? Weird. Eh. Who cares? I know she's not a double agent. She's my partner. And she's the real deal. Morning, Kate, I say to her, keeping my eyes fixed to the ceiling, not at all looking at her impeccable cannons filling out the lacy meerkat hair turtleneck she's wearing. For her bottoms, she's wearing a powerful, skin-tight, tilapia-scale skirt that stretches around her firm, crescent-moon-shaped buttocks. A pair of cave-bat fur boots stretch up her endless, sexy legs. Even though she's not into it, she always dresses to the nines when we got a big meeting. And damn, I love her style. What's up, Fold? She says. Dick fall off yet? She adds, her go-to joke about the amount of sex I have on account of my job being a professional sex spy, but also because she's probably interested in my package, too. Still here, want me to prove it? I croon. But literally the last thing in the world I want to see. Kate is a natural beauty. And when I say that, I mean natural jugs and natural ass, but both are big. Natural, but huge. The kind of natural that would seem fake, but I know it's natural because she's not the kind to get fakes. But it's her face that really seals the deal for me. A tangle of earthy brown hair falls playfully onto the perfect girl next door face. Provided you live next door to a house full of supermodels or A-list actresses, then she's absolutely got that look. Light brown freckles dot across her face like the stars in the night sky forming a dermatological constellation of the gods. Her teeth are a brilliant white, but they just miss out on total perfection on account of the slightly larger than normal gap between the front two. But I love it. As if this wasn't enough, she leaves an unmistakable fresh fragrance in her wake everywhere she walks. A smell that can only be described as what you'd imagine a prized Norse beauty would smell like after a day in the hot springs, where the Norse goddess is lathered up by her demure but equally smoking handmaiden. A handmaiden that makes sure to hit every crack and crevice with a damp rag that's been scented by mountain flowers so beautiful and rare that only the village's most daring adventurers would make the trek to the summit to bring them back for these village sirens at bath time. That said, I haven't spent too much time thinking about Kate's smell or anything because that would be weird. But it's all no matter how she looks or smells because Kate's a lesbian. I know she's a lesbian because we've never hooked up. Though we've been partners and friends for something like 10 years, I've never once inserted inside of her, which 100% means she's a lesbian. I'm not a lesbian fold, you fucking idiot, she says. And you're doing that thing again, where you think something in your head but say it out loud at the same time. I curse under my breath and think another thought just for you guys. That thought is that Kate likes to say she's not a lesbian, but, again, I know she is because I've never been resisted by a single human being in my life, and it's the only way I know how to process it. Again, Fold, she says, you're saying your thoughts. Might be time to get that checked out by a professional, and, again, not a lesbian. I've even shown you an actual sex tape between me and my fiancé that has me orgasming to his penis being inside of me in it. I've seen the tape. You definitely weren't enjoying it. Not with that clown, at least. I tell her, this time out loud on purpose. Besides, I don't trust that guy one bit. We've been engaged for what? Five years now and he still hasn't gone through with it? I would rather consult a set of whorehouse anal beads for relationship advice than hear it from you, Fold, so save it. And what's not to trust? Vance is the best person I've ever met, she says. Why? Because he works with retards? Big deal, I snarl back. 
for maybe the 10,000th time, they're developmentally disabled. And yes, that's one reason among many. Vance is an incredible man. He's just taking his time. Yeah, forget that. I trust him about as much as the retards he works with. And I've got my eye on them, too. Deceptively strong. I think they're actually hiding how smart they really are. I tell her as she looks to the ground and covers her face, taking in that revelation. But I will give retards one thing. Just taking one look at them, you can tell. They've all got huge hogs. Kate inhales deeply before coming back from that knowledge bomb, saying, As offensive as it is every time you say the word retard, I'm even more revolted when you use the phrase hog, so could you please hang that one up before I have to go to HR? I shoot her a wink that says, Of course I'm not giving up the best phrase in the world for dick, as the elevator door opens. We emerge into the long hallway on the bottom floor of Cobalt. It's dark and quiet. So quiet that you can hear your heart beating in your chest, and so dark that you can't see. Now that's dark. It's hotter than hell down here, too. The kind of hot where you sweat. I start sweating because of it. On paper, this is called the negative 13th floor because it's 13 floors below the ground. But for us in the biz, we just call it the furnace. One time somebody told me why we call it that, but I forgot. As Kate and I saunter towards the captain's office in the back, we make our customary march through the hallways where all of the agency's most top-secret operations are taking place. Off to our right, a horde of hundreds of genetically modified scorpions dart around the room at blinding speed, tagging orderlies with their stingers. Standard Wednesday. Over in the room to our left, through the inexplicably clear and non-secretive plexiglass windows, we can see a group of scientists putting thousands of microscopic tracking devices in bags of plain yellow Lay's chips because... As one scientist told me over a happy hour cocktail a few years ago. Only the nation's sickest fucks eat those things, and we need to know where they are at all times. While we continue down the halls, I try my best not to look at Kate's rockin' bod and focus on the seven-foot-tall humanoid iguana over in room seven smoking an entire pack of cigarettes in one inhale. Before I can even process that, I glance to my right to find ex-special operative, now-deceased Guy Fieri in cryostasis, given an eternal shocker to the world awaiting his glorious return to Flavortown whenever we may need it. Getting the picture yet? It's hot down here in the furnace. Stay away from the flames, or, or else, you know, you're going to be in the flames, you know? Right before we can hit the captain's office, there's just one more completely visible room to look inside of. And the second we saunter past, I know something's wrong. You know what, we better hurry to the captain's. Kate tells me, trying to turn my view from the room, but it's too late. I stop and approach the plexiglass, not at all prepared for what I'm about to see. Jesus fucking Christ. I let slip as I stare inside of the room. Inside, it's like I'm looking into a mirror. Only, a mirror that sees ten years into the past. Through the glass standing before us is a ripped, toned, complete hard body shredding the sex slalom. The sex slalom is the training scenario laid out for all of us seduction spies, and one that not a single would-be recruit has passed since I came through the academy. In order to do so, they don't just have to beat my time, but they have to successfully orgasm each of the sex bots inside in the process. It's speed and satisfaction. It takes true skill. But this guy's good. Damn good. He fucks and sucks not just with speed, but with passion, too. Like me. As he thrusts violently inside of one of the sex bots, he's already got a finger halfway into the next. He's hardly even shot his load into the first target when he's instantly hard again, locked and loaded and flipping over the synthetic plastic bot into a reverse cowgirl so good, I swear I could see an actual look of enjoyment flash across the android's face. Kate grabs me by the arm. I really don't think you should see this. I rip my arm free and keep watching, placing my hands to the plexiglass window now. I can feel the thick glass pulsing with each thrust he throws into the impassioned doggy style he's rocking with the next bot. Boom. 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 The rhythm of his sexing is almost primal. Godlike. The thumping cadence of the bedposts in heaven when God has really given it to Jesus or whatever the hell happens up there. He's good. Damn, he's good. I have to turn to Kate. Did you know about this? I ask. I... I did. She finally replies, but I advise against it, I promise. They said they're just bringing him on as an intern, not to phase you out or anything like that. I want to believe her, but as she puts a consoling hand on my huge biceps, the force of his passionate love making cracks the thick plexiglass into a jagged spiderweb born out of lust and patriotism. 
I watch as the glass splinters and spreads while the white lab coat wearing evaluators nearly drop their pens in such a hurry to write down everything they've just witnessed. I, d I don't even... Why? I say to Kate. I've never felt better. I've never been better. Why would they need someone else? I don't know. It's probably nothing. Forget it. Let's go. We have a real mission to get to, Fold. Kate turns me towards the captain's door, but before we can enter, the young stallion spins and spots us. He's standing before his conquest of satisfied sex bots, both male and female. He heads towards me like some sort of sexual Genghis Khan, trampling over the bodies of his victims. But only if Genghis Khan has a little bit of that weird after-sex cum still dripping from his dick, and was kind of dribbling a little bit of it on the floor with each step he took. Genghis cum, if you will. Either way, the new guy approaches the splintered window and puts his face right up alongside of it, so close that I can nearly feel his hot breath through the glass. Without saying a word, he begins to pop his pecs up and down. The left pec, bang. The right pec, boom. He pumps up and down in perfect synchronicity and begins to unleash a devilishly handsome grin so intense that I nearly break my stare. But I don't. I remind myself, I'm fold fucking tan guy. The original seduction agent. There's no amount of peck pops in the world that can change that. So I take my hand and make a devil horn gesture with my pinky and pointer fingers outstretched and directed at the young buck. And once I've held it long enough in his face, I turn the two outstretched fingers towards my own face and use them to push my cool sunglasses firmly back onto my head. Only, I forgot I had already taken off both pairs of my sunglasses, so I end up gouging both my left and right eyes extremely hard. And I scream for a minute and begin to cry a little bit. Kate notices and ushers me towards the captain's room as, even though my back's turned, I can feel the young hotshot is absolutely cowering in fear. He must be blown away by my intimidating gesture as we slip into the command center. Another close call. Captain Castle is at the end of a long metal table briefing Kate and I on our next assignment. At least, I think he is. I can't see my hand in front of my face on account of the absurd amount of cigar smoke that Cap's blown out of his ninth stogie since we've walked in. Kate's eyes are watering and she's coughing violently as I try to make out the PowerPoint presentation at the end of the room, but it's simply impossible. But hell, Cap likes his smokes, what can I say? Come on up, take a look at your next target, guys. The captain says, immediately after unleashing another dragon's breath of smoke our way. Kate and I fight our way through a level of fog that belongs more in a kid's laser tag arena than a top secret briefing room, but again, he's the captain. He gets what he wants. Feast your eyes on this beauty, Fold, the captain says as we finally get close enough to see his PowerPoint. The captain presses a button on his clicker and we have to wait a minute as the image on the PowerPoint zips around from one corner of the screen to the next before filling in slowly in little small bits like pieces of a puzzle. The cap likes adding zany transitions to his PowerPoints. I like it too. When the image does finally come into focus, I'm not ready for it. Incredible. I involuntarily babble out. I can hardly believe how beautiful the woman is on screen. I've seen and slept with perfect tens for all of my natural-born life, but she makes them all look like absolute fucking zeros. The rare eleven. The first thing I notice are her tits, of course. They check out. They're massive. But once I stop staring at those, I can't take my eyes off of her so blonde it's white hair falling all the way down just above the crack of her ass. I've never seen hair so white or long. It's absolutely breathtaking. The gilded locks of an angel. Her face is angular in all the right spots, but her cheeks have that little chipmunk thing going on too, so we steer clear of the emaciated skeletal meth look that ruins so many supermodel types. But it's the eyes that really stop me in my tracks. A set of piercing blue orbs shine like the crown jewels on a lost Amazonian statue of a monkey that the natives all revere and fear for its power. I can even hear an audible gasp from Kate. Kate's hot, sure, but even she knows when she's in the presence of greatness. Meet Aurora Diamond Street, the captain says to us. I can tell by the look in your eyes, but also mostly by the throbbing erection tenting up in your pants fold that you are enraptured. But don't be. You're looking at one of the most dangerous double agents to ever set foot on our soil. Or so we think. So you think, Kate says. Truthfully, we don't know too much about her. Not yet, at least. She just popped onto our radar, entered the country on a bogus German passport, but we have no idea where she's from or what she's even doing here. The captain tells us. So why should we assume she's up to no good? I ask, like a pro spy. Because airport security cameras caught her with this. The captain says as he transitions to another slide. 
This time, there's a sound effect of a spring boinging, and the picture slowly fizzles onto the screen, taking forever and kind of killing the suspense, but again, I love his style. Finally, the picture comes into focus, and we see the gorgeous woman holding a sheet of paper with a bunch of people's pictures on it. Most notably, there's a shot of the president with a huge red X drawn over top of him. Uh, It's illegal to draw on pictures of the president, I quickly put together. Got it. We'll kill her immediately, I finish. Kate puts her head in her hands as the captain takes a thoughtful rip off of his cigar. No, Foley. That's a hit list. She's here to kill our president. Fuck, I say as the seriousness of this assignment settles in. I've had some huge ones in the past. I've slept with people out to do harm to senators and engaged in pillow talk with thieves planning to steal some of the world's most treasured artwork. I bed female spies and walked away with all their most classified documents in the morning. I've done it all. I've done them all. Or so I thought. But protecting the president? My dick has never been called on to do that. Fold, Kate, this is going to be your most dangerous mission yet. Are you up for it? Absolutely, we both reply in unison. I stand and grab one of the captain's many still smoldering half-chewed cigars lying on the table and put it between my fingers. Captain, you just tell us when and where, and we'll be there ready to seduce and take down this target with lethal precision. I pull the cigar up to my lips. Even though I never smoked one in my life, I know this will be the perfect way to punctuate my badass cockiness. I've never been more ready for anything in my goddamn life, I say as I bring the cigar to my mouth, burning end first like any non-smoker would assume, and proceed to scorch and sear my lips so badly that they instantly blister and bubble like cheddar dancing on the top of a perfectly cooked tray of oven-made macaroni and cheese. My screams vibrate inside of the cold metal room as I rock the headquarters to their very foundations, falling to my knees. Though inarguably the worst pain of my life, I never break eyes from my next target, my most dangerous target, the ravishing Aurora Diamond Street.